The uh, keen eye among you may have noticed we've often been ignoring air drag. We say it. Uh, air resistance is, is negligible. Ignore air drag. Um, and some of you may have asked, why are we doing that? Why can't we just deal with it? So today we're going to deal with it. And this is a pocket topic in physics, which is to say it comes up from time to time. It is actually quite important, uh, but is not one of kind of our main topics. So you will see it pop up on the test here and there. You are responsible for knowing it, but we're not going to spend a huge amount of time on it in class. So what is drag? Well, at its core, uh, drag is just another form uh, of friction, and it's specifically a friction uh, with fluids. Uh, so moving through air, moving through water, for instance. Um, it opposes velocity, it opposes movement. I mean, it's friction, right? Um, and uh, it also depends on velocity, and that's another uh, another difference from our normal friction. The faster you try to move through a fluid, the more it resists. So as your velocity increases, uh, so does drag. Uh, and generally, it's actually quite complicated, um, as we will see today. Um, there is an equation for it, so you can kind of see here we've got some box of mass m falling through the air. There's gravity down and a force of drag up. Uh, and in general, the equation goes like this. And if you've taken aerospace engineering, you'll recognize this. Um, the force of drag is uh, 1 half, that's a number, you know that, times the coefficient of drag, times the cross-sectional area of the object, times uh, rho, which is air density, times v squared. So a lot of things that depend on the specific size and shape of the object uh, the air density and everything. We in physics often abs abstract a lot of that way, abstract a lot of that away. And today we're just going to consider a force of the form kV squared, where k is some constant that varies from object to object and situation to situation that tells us uh, how the force varies with velocity. But we're going to just treat this as a force equal to kV squared. Um, and this has a couple interesting, uh, interesting uh, effects right away. So one thing is, let's imagine we have some object that's falling. So at first, we just drop it, uh, and it starts out at a velocity of zero from rest. And we drop it, and there's some gravity down. Let's say gravity down is a force of 500 newtons, right? Well, we drop it. Well, what happens? There's a force down. It starts to accelerate downwards. Uh, a little while later, we check it. And, of course, gravity is still pulling down with a force of 500 newtons. But now it's going a little bit faster, right? It's sped up a little bit. It's got some velocity. Uh, because it's got some velocity, drag starts to kick in, and we get a little bit of drag. And I'm just making up these numbers. Let's say the force of drag is 100 newtons. Well, 500 newtons is still bigger than 100 newtons, so it's still accelerating downwards. It's going to get faster. So sometime later, it's going 500 new. It's got gravity 500 newtons down, but it's been accelerating and accelerating. So now it's uh, it's going quite a bit faster than it was before. And now the opposing force from drag, because velocity goes up, the opposing drag force goes up, and now the opposing drag force is 400 newtons. Well. Still, 500 is bigger than 400, so it's going to accelerate downwards. But as it accelerates, that drag force is going to get bigger, 450, 475, 485, 490. And you can imagine at some point getting yourself into a scenario where you've got gravity at 500 newtons down, and the thing is still moving, right? It's still got some rather large downward velocity at this point. But you can imagine that that drag force is also exactly 500 newtons. And this is a very specific case. Well, if the two forces are balanced, then, then our net force is nothing. And if our net force is nothing, then our velocity is constant. And this is uh, a very specific, uh, very specific sort of behavior that you may have heard before. Uh, this condition where we speed up, speed up, but due to drag, we hit some constant velocity. Uh, this is called terminal velocity. We hit a terminal velocity. Um, we hit a terminal velocity. Now, uh, 
you might be asking, what is that terminal velocity? Well, again, we can actually find that um, using this, right? If we have mg down and kv squared up, well, it's going to be terminal velocity when those two things are equal. So we can, in fact, just write, uh, we can, in fact, just write kv squared equals mg and conclude that we hit our terminal velocity at a speed of whatever the square root of mg over k is. Um, okay, well, that's pretty good. That allows us to figure out what our terminal velocity is, assuming we know some things about our object, what we, know, we know what k is, et cetera, et cetera. What if we wanted to know something a little bit more complicated? What if we actually wanted to know uh, how this thing's velocity changes over time? Obviously, it starts at 0 and ends up at the at some terminal velocity, but how does it get there? Is it nice and smooth and linear? Is it wobbly? What happens? Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to do what we always do. Uh, we're going to draw a free body diagram, which I've already drawn here. Uh, and we're going to do some Newton's second law. So we're going to come here and we're going to write our little thing. We're going to write, you know, F net equals MA. And in this case, for our net force, we'll take down to be our positive direction. We'll write mg minus kv squared equals ma. Um, and if I want to know the velocity, I probably want to find my acceleration. Uh, because I remember from kinematics, if I know my acceleration, I can integrate and find my velocity. So um, because my acceleration is going to be all over the place, it's going to be constantly changing. So let's go ahead and divide through by mass, and we'll get my acceleration is equal to g minus k over mv squared. And here I'm going to do a funny little thing. Um, I'm actually going to replace a with something else. I'm going to write it this way. I'm going to write it as dv dt, which we know is equal to a, a is the derivative of velocity, equals g minus k over mv squared. Uh, and I'm going to circle this because this is actually really, 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 really important. This is what's called a differential equation. This is what's called a differential equation. So let's actually take a moment and set this aside and figure out what the heck a differential equation is. Take it away, Mr. Bates. Thanks, Mr. Bates. I'll take it from here. Uh, so an important question, what the heck is a differential equation? And uh, the basic answer is it's any equation that involves a differential. That is, that involves a derivative. So an ex a simple example might be something like uh, dx dt equals 0 which basically tells us that x never changes. Uh, this involves a first derivative, so it's what's called a first order differential equation. You might have something, you know, dv dt equals 4. Uh, this is also a first order differential equation. It tells us that whatever our variable v is, it's changing uh, at a, a rate of 4. Uh, you could also have, for instance, the second derivative, d squared, x dt squared, this is actually a differential equation we'll be seeing later in the year, uh, is negative k over m times x. This has a second derivative in it, so it's a second order differential equation. And we are going to be talking today only about one specific kind, uh, which is going to be a first order separable differential equation. Uh, what does it mean to be separable? Well, it means you can separate it into two parts. You can get all of the y stuff on one side, all of one variable on one side, and all of the x variable on the other side. So let's do a simple example. You can get x and y separated. Um, let's try to solve a differential equation that looks like this, that looks like dy dx equals x. And when we solve a differential equation, we're saying, um, what are all the possible functions y such that the derivative of y with respect to x equals x? Now, this might not seem that complicated to you. 
But what we're going to do is we're going to solve it anyway. We're going to look at this and say, okay, well, I want to separate it. I want it to be separable. So I'm going to get all the x stuff on one side and all the y stuff on the other side. So I'm going to multiply dx over, and you can do that. dy over dx is a fraction. So I'm going to dy equals x dx. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take an integral of each side. Well, the integral of dy is just y. The integral of x dx, you might be familiar, is 1 half x squared plus a constant c. Uh, and you might ask, why not a constant c on both sides? I guess you could do that. I guess you could have a c on both sides. Uh, but part of the thing with differential equations is these constants are total unknowns. We don't know what they are. So why have a constant on both sides? I could just as easily take this, this number d, subtract it from both sides, have c minus d, and then call c minus d the new c. So we're really just going to get in the habit of having just one constant, um, because again, we haven't decided what c is yet, so why do we need to, to worry too much about there being two numbers? We can just lump them together into one number. And so there's an important point here, which is we don't get just one solution. We don't get just one solution. We get whole families of solutions. Oh, isn't that sweet? For instance, uh, you know, y equals 1 half x squared is certainly a solution. If I take a derivative, I get x. But so is uh, plus 7 or minus 1,000. Any number I put here plus pi to the pi. Any number I put here doesn't matter. When I take a derivative, it goes away. So I can get this whole family of functions uh, that are all, you know, have different offsets and they all work. Let's try a slightly more complex example. Uh, let's change our color also, why not? And we'll go with uh, dy dx equals y. So this is a, a different question. Differential equations are kind of a way of answering the question of what happens, this is the set of all functions where when I take its derivative, I end up with the original function again. Okay, well, you might already have an idea of where this goes, but let's try it anyway. Uh, so we get dy over y equals dx. So here I'm separating out the x and the y's, and I'm going to go ahead and take an integral of each side. Now, the keen eye among you might remember that the integral of dy over y is, in fact, the natural logarithm of y. This is going to be x plus c. And again, I don't need a c on both sides. Uh, I just need one of them. Now I'm going to go, go e to the whatever, e to the power of both sides. So e to the ln y is just y. So I get e to the x plus c. Now you might be remembering that how exponents work. This is actually, I'm going to pull the c to the front, e to the c times e to the x. Now e to the c, this is just e to some constant. Um, and again, we don't know what c is yet, but it's pretty clear here that when I do e to the c, I'm going to get a different constant. So we're just going to call that a. I don't know what a is either, e to the x. And what's kind of neat here is we get a different family of functions. And I want to notice, note, we have a degree of freedom. Here, our degree of freedom was additive, that as we added things to it, do, 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 it moved the function up and down. Here, our whole family of different solutions get multiplied. So we'll get e to the x, 2e to the x, 3e to the x, negative e to the x. Um, because when I take a derivative of ae to the x, I just get a e to the x, no matter whether that's 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, uh, no matter what the value of a is. So we can get lots of different uh, interesting um, values here. And so our goal and I'm go is going to be to apply this separable method uh, to the differential equation we just found. So back to you, Mr. Bates. All right. Well, now that we've got uh, what a differential equation is under our belt, and we've solved a couple separable ones. Let's take a look at this differential equation and see if we can solve it, shall we? Well, the answer is uh, this is actually solvable, but it turns out to be pretty hard. Um, and if you're interested, I'd be happy to record a video where we actually do solve it uh, in the full way. But um, for the purposes of AP Physics C, we actually usually don't solve these differential equations. This is considered too difficult for our class. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to do what engineers and scientists often do when something is too hard, which is we're going to make some simplifying 
assumptions. So the simplifying assumption we're going to make here is uh, what if drag weren't kV squared? What if instead our force of drag uh, were only k times v? What if, uh, sometimes you'll see negative kV to indicate that it goes in the opposite direction. Um, sometimes you'll see it written like this. I don't know why they don't put a negative here too, to show that it goes in the negative direction, opposite velocity. Um, you know, we're just gonna assume that uh, this is our force of drag. And the reason is it still has many of the same properties. It still allows for a terminal velocity because our, our resistance force goes up uh, with speed. Although our terminal velocity in this case is a little different. It's just mg over k instead of the square root of all that jazz. Uh, and what, it, what what's important is it turns out actually to be much more solvable. And so what we're going to do is we're going to solve it today. Um, if you go ahead and set up that differential equation, you get something that looks very similar. dv over dt equals g minus k over m times v. So here we want to do our separable thing. So we're going to end up with uh, dv over all of this jazz. Uh, equals dt. And now we're going to integrate both sides. Uh, well, when we integrate the left side, it, this may look a little intimidating, but notice it's a bunch of, it's dv over a bunch of stuff involving v. And I hope you can convince yourself that, and again, if you're, if you've had uh, a year of calculus under your belt, this will probably be a little bit more familiar, but you might recognize the integral of dv over something involving v as being the natural log of all this. Um, but this isn't quite enough because if you kind of squint and take a derivative of this, uh, we've got uh, some chain rule business to take care of. So we will in fact end up with a negative m over k out front. So um, you can justify that to yourself, take a derivative of this and you'll get uh, that back. And on the right side we get uh, t plus c, some constant c. So I'm going to go ahead and just get rid of this, these, do a little algebra here. Uh, negative uh, kT over m plus c. Now I just want to make a little note. Some of you may be going like, huh, what happened? Did you forget to multiply the constant c by all of that stuff? And uh, I didn't. I didn't. Um, Remember that that constant c in calculus is, is an unknown constant. We don't know what it is yet. Um, so whenever we're multiplying it by something or adding something else to it, we can kind of just absorb it in, right? We, we haven't set what the value of c is yet, so why should we care if it gets multiplied by some number? Um, we can just change what c is later. So it kind of absorbs all of that stuff. Uh, I'm now going to raise both sides to the, to the e power, or e to the both sides, so I end up with this e to the negative kt over m, oops, plus c. Um, now, as you might recall, uh, this plus c uh, ends up being sort of a multiplicative constant here. So we'll get some a e to the minus kt over m. That's similar to what we did during our little digression there. Um, a little bit of algebra then gives me uh, k over m times v equals uh, g minus all this jazz, a e to the negative k t over m. So I end up with uh, v of t equals mm -mm -mm, uh, mg over k minus uh, and again, look, I'm multiplying a by a bunch of numbers, but I don't know what a is yet, so I'm just going to leave it as a. Uh, e to the negative kt over m. So there's a couple things. We're not quite done. We're almost done. We solved for v. Uh, there's a couple things. First of all, I want to note uh, mg over k. We know what mg over k is. That's our terminal velocity. And then uh, there's always that issue of what's called an IVP, an initial value problem in uh, differential equations, which is to say these unknown constants, can we actually figure out what they are by specifying some initial values? And in this case, we know that we want our uh, 
our initial velocity to be zero. So if I quickly plug in uh, zero for v, or excuse me, zero for t, I end up with mg over k minus a e to the, well, if t is zero, the t is just gonna be zero. I know e to the zero is one, and I want this all to be zero. I want it to start at rest. So it turns out that a also has to be mg over k. A also has to be that terminal velocity number. So we're actually going to write this. Uh, I'm going to write it over here in a more triumphant lettering. Uh, we end up with that our velocity as a function of time looks like vt times 1 minus e to the negative kt over m. And why is this neat? What does this actually tell us about our, uh, our motion? Well, it's worth remembering, uh, what does e to the negative t look like? You know, if we sketch it over here, e to the negative t kind of looks like this. Oops, uh, it kind of swoops down like that and asymptotically approaches zero. Uh, so one minus e to the t is going to instead asymptotically pro approach one. Um, and so what I get from this is if I look at a velocity time graph of an object that was dropped, um, it's going to start out at rest. It's going to start out at zero. And what it's going to do is it's going to asymptotically approach some value of velocity. And that value of velocity is uh, our terminal velocity. It will never quite reach the terminal velocity. It'll get arbitrarily close, but it'll kind of come up to it, come up near it fairly fast and then level off. Um, what if you try to exceed the terminal velocity? If you take a ball and you throw it down really fast at above its terminal velocity, well, what's going to happen is that it'll actually slow down to the terminal velocity. So uh, things will kind of gravitate to that terminal velocity. So um, let's kind of summarize. Differential equations, as I, as I, as I said, are, are kind of the language of math and physics and engineering moving forward. You're going to see them a whole, whole lot in college. And I just want to impress upon us, what did we do here? We started from a basic question of, hey, what if we had a force that varied with velocity? What would that do? And we actually solved out a simplified version of it uh, using differential equations and got a specific equation that tells us precisely how the object moves and with what velocity at all times, which is a pretty cool thing to end up with. Uh, what do they actually expect you to do with on the exam? Well, on the exam, they'll expect you uh, actually sometimes to be able to, uh, once in a while, they'll ask you to do this whole differential equations thing. More often, they will ask you to sketch graphs like this uh, to make sure that you know what terminal velocity, what that behavior kind of asymptotically approaching a terminal velocity looks like.